Well, as a biologist, there are many different ways to describe or define different species. Right? You can look out in nature and see lots of different variety, variation in nature. And you might look at two trees and say they look like they have different flowers, so they're different species. But there's a specific test that biologists use. This is the biological species concept. This is the formal definition, but basically what it means is that if you mate two organisms together and they either have dead offspring, lethal, or sterile offspring, then those two parents were from two different species. Easy test, pretty practical to do in the laboratory if you have laboratory-sized animals, or dogs. So how do we know as biologists and as dog lovers, I don't own any pets, but I'm still a dog lover. How do we know that these are two members of the same species? What's this? Yeah, what's, what breed is this? Black Lab. Poodle. Now oh, you're getting technical on me. Standard poodle? I don't know. <laughs> so if you, if you mate them together, what do you get? A labradoodle, <laughs> sterile, or no, sorry, fertile and alive, right? It's, it's a fertile organism and it's alive. You can see it there. So that means that the two parents are from the same species. They're not two different biological species. So what's a great example of two closely related biological species that have sterile offspring? Awesome. You're getting there. Oh, by the way, before we get to mules, though, sorry, I forgot this slide was in here. There's a really, I just want to point this out because it's a little bit interesting to think about. That biological species concept, it's a totally arbitrary definition made up by one guy a long time ago. But actually or potentially interbreeding organisms is part of that quote. So are these members of the same species or are these different species? Can they mate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're, okay, so you see where I'm going with this. So there's a lot of gray area, even in the biological species concept, because of this term potentially interbreeding. Does that count in vitro fertilization? We could talk about that later if you're interested. Okay, so you mentioned horses and donkeys. Absolutely. This is the prime example of the biological species concept in action. When you mate a horse and a donkey, the mule their offspring is sterile. This is a primary example of what geneticists call, and biologists in general call, hybrid dysfunction. You mate two organisms together, they have a hybrid offspring, and that offspring is dysfunctional. In this case, it doesn't produce any offspring of its own. It's sterile. So I'm going to be using this term, hybrid dysfunction, a bit through the talk. What I mean is sick kids offspring that are less healthy, less viable, less fertile than their parents. So to get really specific about the types of questions I'm interested in then, I want to know, but not in horses and donkeys or in dogs, what are the genetic differences between horses and donkeys? What are the mutations? What are the DNA sequence differences between those two species that when the sperm from one and the egg from the other fuse and make the mule, that makes the mule sterile. It's a genetic problem. There are differences in the DNA of horses and donkeys that make the mules sterile. In this case, this is a great example because we know what that difference is. Horses and donkeys have different numbers of chromosomes. So when you get a mule, it's got an odd number of chromosomes, which is a bad thing for most organisms. Horses and donkeys are diploid. They have two copies of every chromosome. Mules don't really know what to do because they're aneuploid, because they got weird numbers of chromosomes in the sperm and the egg from their two parents. So it's already, this question is already answered in horses and donkeys. I want to know, other than horses and donkeys and dogs, what are the other ways that genetic changes in two groups of organisms, when you combine them together, can cause their offspring to be screwed up? Because that's the essence of speciation, biological species formation. This is the starting point of species formation. First, you get sterile hybrids, then horses and donkeys, because they're not mating with each other and making hybrid offspring anymore, they get a little bit more genetically different and a little bit more genetically different. Pretty soon, they're full-blown species. 
Their offspring are not just sterile. They can't have any offspring together at all. What are those DNA changes that can do that? So I want to walk through a little model of, to help you maybe think about how genes from different parents might come together in offspring and cause the offspring to be less healthy. So here I'm going to model a chromosome as a horizontal line. It's a double helix of DNA. It's just a single line. And I'm color coding populations. So you can think of these as horses and donkeys if you want. Red is the horse. Blue is the donkey, let's say. And across the top here are generation numbers. Sorry if you're not a geneticist. Parental generation, first filial generation, second filial generation. So a diploid organism in, its, in every cell, in the nucleus of every cell, it will have two copies of each chromosome. Right? This organism is from the red population, so it has two of the red flavored chromosome in every cell. And the same is true for the blue individual. They've got two blue versions of the chromosome in every cell. And I'm just looking at two different spots on this chromosome, say gene A and gene B. They all have uppercase A's and uppercase B's. So at this point, these are two different populations. But now let's imagine that the red versions of genes A and B make two red versions of proteins. Ooh, red on red, not good. Maybe I can switch to a different laser pointer. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. So gene A makes protein A. Looks kind of like one of those one by one square Legos. And gene B makes a receptor for gene A. So it's got a shape so that the two proteins can fit together properly. See curved surface on one protein and a recessed surface on the other. So those two might be able to physically interact, the two proteins inside the cell. Presumably, that does something good for the organism in this story. And then you'll notice that there's a difference on the proteins created from the blue versions, which geneticists call alleles. The blue versions of the same chromosome make protein A and protein B, but they look different. Because the DNA sequences of the chromosomes are different. The red chromosomes are different from the blue chromosomes. They've got different DNA sequences. So they make the same proteins, but they have different shapes. So here they're more like triangular surface and a receptor for that surface. So if you're a red organism, and if it's important for these interactions physically to fit together those proteins, if that's really important for the health of the organism, which well, ask our cell biology instructors. Protein-protein interactions are really important. Those individuals, the red individual and the blue individual, are fine by themselves. But what happens when they mate? You get one chromosome, one red chromosome inherited in one of the gametes from, say, the dad, male. Let's say the female is from the blue population. So she contributes one of her chromosomes to her offspring. So now you have a hybrid. It's got one each, shown up here. It's making equal numbers or so of the red proteins and the blue proteins. So my question to you is, is this an OK scenario for the health of this organism? We've got a mixture of red and blue protein A and red and blue protein B. Is that going to work? What do you think? Hmm? Sure, because A, can, the red proteins can interact and do their job, and the blue proteins can still interact and do their job. So F1 is fine. What happens, though, when we get, and I'm just showing another F1, same genotype, same proteins down here. So we're going to mate two, unfortunately in this example, brother and sister together, and get to the F2 generation. So at the F2 generation, something weird happens, which you might have heard about at some point, a weird thing called recombination where chromosomes break and exchange bits. So in the F2 generation, you start getting these hybrid chromosomes that are part blue, part red. And in the F2 generation, then you can get a situation like this, where you have both copies of gene A come from the blue chromosome. Population 2 provides all of the copies of A, but you get both B genes that make the B proteins from the red population. Is that good or bad? That's bad. Because those A proteins don't fit with any of the B proteins, 
And in this example, which I haven't really explained in detail, those proteins don't interact. That doesn't let the organism do something really important like make babies. <coughs> Whereas the other individual or another individual in the F2 generation is fine because it still has copies of the A and B red proteins and the A and B blue proteins. So it's still okay. So that might be a scenario that causes species formation. You get genetic changes, the differences between the red and the blue chromosomes, that when you combine them together, they can cause sick or sick or inviable offspring. I was trying to be purposefully antagonistic in the title of the talk, something about the molecules that keep species apart or something like that. So I want to mention, this is, I think, one of the most important concepts in what I'm telling you today, I think. We have a lot of words for these. What, so dogs are, what was it again? Breeds. What other words do we have for different groups of the same species? Race. Race. What else? What do plants? Variety. Vari yeah, variety is a good word. I know, written some of them up there. Right, so there, we have all of these words to describe different compartments, groups of organisms within one species. Population strains, races, clades, accessions, isolates. So there is not usually, other than maybe horses and donkeys, there's not a single genetic change that co immediately causes one group of populations to become two different species at an instant. The process of two groups of organisms becoming reproductively incompatible, meaning they can't have viable or fertile offspring, takes a lot of time and a lot of different sequence changes in their DNA. There isn't just a single magical mutation that causes speciation, except for that change in chromosome number in horses and donkeys. But that one aside, you can think of a single difference here, a difference between gene uppercase A and a different version in a different population, the lowercase a. Same gene, two different versions, big A, little a. So a geneticist might look at those and say, oh, those are two different strains of the same species. And they might look then at a different gene, gene B, and say, okay, well now these two populations have differences in gene A and in gene B. So maybe now they're a little bit farther down the continuum towards becoming different species. So maybe now we call them something else arbitrary. I don't even remember what words I wrote up there. It's totally fine because it's arbitrary. The only time we get to something that's not arbitrary is when we finally accumulate enough DNA sequence changes in enough genes that the biological species concept occurs. You mate the two populations together, and they finally have dead or sterile offspring. So the more genetic divergence, the more, more genetically different two groups are, the more likely they are to be speciating, becoming different species. Now, speciation doesn't occur just because of genetic changes, but genetics is a big part of this. So to be really specific in a general sort of way now, I'll rephrase my main thrust in research, which is more specifically things like, what are these genes, A and B? That is, what are the actual identities of the genes? What do they do? What do the proteins that they make do? And how do these sorts of mutations affect those proteins so that they no longer fit together and cause sterility or inviability? What are the mutations that cause and reinforce species formation? By the way, I'm recording this. I forgot to record the first slide or so. I'll post this on YouTube tonight. So I'm glad you're taking notes. But if you want to you know, scroll back and get more details later, you can do that. Okay. So that's my goal. There's a big problem studying speciation. Geneticists, do you know what geneticists really love to do? We set up crosses. It's all about setting up crosses. Classical genetics, take two organisms, mate them together, collect their offspring, study the offspring, mate them together, study their offspring. It's all about the transmission of DNA from generation to generation and how it causes different phenotypes, different traits and characteristics. But the problem is, studying speciation is not something you can do really easily with genetics, at least classical genetics, because what happens when you get the horse and the donkey and they make the mule? 
mule is sterile, then what the hell am I going to do? I can't make any more offspring. I've got a sterile organism. I can't see how it passes its genes on to its offspring. They're non-existent. So there's a workaround here. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. To put this into context, you don't need to see this. Don't worry about the details. It's small on purpose. In 2010, this review paper was written by a person who studies speciation genes in fruit flies, in Drosophila. This, at that time, now probably needs to be updated because it was almost a decade ago, this is a list, even though you can't see the details, of all of the genes that were known to play a role in speciation between any pairs of organisms on Earth. And we've got yeast, yeast, Arabidopsis, plant, Arabidopsis, fruit fly, Arabidopsis, fruit fly, fruit fly, mice, fruit fly, fruit fly, fruit fly, fruit fly, fruit fly. I dare you to say fruit fly 10 times fast. <laughs> right? That's all we knew about the genes that cause speciation. It was all model organisms, and it's mostly yeast, plants, mice, and Drosophila. Model organisms. But that doesn't really tell us about all the different ways that mutations could cause speciation. So to get around this issue, I propose a new term. I'd like you to help me spread this term. <laughs> because there's, there's like a geneticist. I'm trying to spread my information. There's a problem with the term dysfunction. I think a lot of people, including geneticists, hear the word dysfunction. I get this. People heckle me at conferences all the time when I say dysfunction and I don't tell them what I mean. It's a classical term, hybrid dysfunction, like the sterile mule or a lethal hybrid offspring. People get in their minds, probably rightfully so, that dysfunction means no function. So classically, people think of the word dysfunction meaning dead or sterile. But I just said that we can't really work studying speciation genetics when we have hybrids that are totally dead, well, dead, or totally sterile. What we need is to find a situation where hybrid offspring are less healthy than the parents, but not totally sterile. We want to find a case where we can mate two populations together and find a situation where maybe their kids are sick, less healthy compared to the parents, but not yet fully speciated, somewhere at the top of the continuum, where there's some genetic difference. And that brings me to the worm that we work with, Cenoraptitis briggsi, T-U, C. briggsi, or just C if you want. It's a close relative of C. elegans, classic genetic model organism. But these are way better for studying speciation than C. elegans. Importantly and coolly, they have two sexes, males and hermaphrodites, which is really cool. Self-fertile hermaphrodites. One organism makes its own sperm and its own eggs and can self-fertilize and make more of itself. That's awesome. It's really useful in the laboratory, too. <coughs> these are actually a millimeter in size in real life, not that size. So the reason that Briggsy is much better than Elegans is genetic diversity. So we've got, there are both C. Elegans and C. Briggsy, two different strains of or species of the same genus, collected from all over the world. I happen to work with two in particular. One, AF16, which I'm going to color code red so you don't really have to remember the strain nomenclature. I will say AF16 a lot. But it's the red strain. It's red because it's from the tropics. And a strain from Japan, blue, temperate, I'm going to refer to as HK104. And all of these populations of the same species, C. briggsi, are really genetically different from each other compared to C. elegans. So you can collect C. elegans from the same part of the world. They're all very similar to each other at the DNA sequence level. So they're bad for studying speciation because there's not a lot of genetic difference between populations. Before I started working on worms, this phylogenetic tree was published. You don't need to know really how to read a phylogenetic tree, but here's the basic primer. Here is the location of the strain of interest for me, one, AF16. The length of the branches that connect it to any other strain or population is relative to the number of DNA sequence changes between them. So if two strains appear really close together, or populations really close together 
in the, on the branches, that means they're very similar genetically. If you looked at their DNA sequences, you'd only find a very rare difference. And it was really striking to people that there are a lot of strains from the tropical areas that are very closely genetically related, and then there's this big difference in DNA sequence that separates the tropical and the temperate groups, which made people start wondering, maybe climate is driving these two populations apart. Maybe there are some sequence differences that are all sequence similarities within the tropical group that are different from the temperate group. And so if you, maybe if you took a temperate worm and you moved it to the tropics, it would crap out because it's got the wrong genes and vice versa. So we, in my lab, hybridize usually a tropical worm and a temperate worm, and we find out, are their offspring okay? It's basically what we do. We stare at microscopes, we move hermaphrodites and males onto plates, we set up crosses, we study their offspring. So here are a couple of chromosomes, and I'm just going to try to give you a really brief primer about genotyping, how we distinguish AF16s from HK104s. They look identical. You can't tell them apart by looking at them. The only way we can distinguish them is we know that there are sequence differences between these two populations, so we have to do some sequence analysis of their DNA to know which worm we're working with. So. If we took those two chromosomes and we lined them up like that, can you see where the sequence difference is in this example? The top one, this top line is Gattaca, and here it's gat caca. <laughs> you can't really spell anything interesting with four letters. Amino acids, fine. DNA, it's horrible. Okay, so there is one DNA sequence difference right there in the middle. Right, so those are the four letters of DNA, and we're looking at the sequences of an AF16 chromosome on top, Gattaca, and HK104 on the bottom. So the point that I want to make here is that we can not bother drawing elaborate double helices. We could just replace that, maybe. with a single line, so I'm, again, back to representing chromosomes with single lines, not both strands of the helix. And we could just use a blue dot to represent the fact that there's an HK104 blue genotype at that particular spot on the chromosome. So this is sort of a nomenclature I'm going to use from here on out. And we don't just look at a single spot on a single chromosome. That's nice, but we can look at multiple spots on the chromosomes to find out what the genotype of an individual is, not just at one spot, but at lots of spots. So later we might see something that looks like that, a chromosome where we have red genotypes here, one spot on a chromosome, then we have similar nucleotides, and then we hit some place where there's a chromosome that has an HK104, nucleotide, not AF16, and HK104, back to AF16. So this is one of those hybrid chromosomes that gets generated after the F1 and F2 generation. Meiosis breaks up chromosomes and rearranges. So the question with genotyping organisms is to try to find mutations that cause speciation. Basically, we need to figure out what is that question mark. We know spots to look on the chromosomes to distinguish AF16s and HK104s, but we have to actually have a technique to figure out what is that nucleotide, what is that letter? Is it the AF16 version or is it the HK104 version? So that's all about genotypes. So anytime I show you a red chromosome that's from AF16, blue chromosome is from HK104, and that's the most important thing. If you were spacing out there, that's fine. The most important thing to know is we can tell whether a chromosome is the red version, AF16, or the blue version, sorry, 
red version, AF16, blue version, HK104, because there are specific nucleotides that are different between the two, and we know what those are. So we can go look at the chromosomes and tell which parts of the chromosomes came from AF16 and which from HK104. So in my lab, not only do we set up a process in sterile microscopes, but we also do a lot of DNA extractions and genotyping assays to tell worms apart and to study their offspring. So before I started this work, there was one piece of evidence, just one, that was already published that suggested that AF16 and HK104 might indeed, red and blue, might be coming different species. The hint that their offspring might be starting to get a little bit unhealthy. And this is it. In 2008, somebody did the exact same experiment. They crossed the two populations together, AF16 and HK104, and they measured how, what percent of their offspring were dead, lethal. So on its own, so you take a single hermaphrodite. That's why hermaphroditism is so cool. You take one hermaphrodite, you let her produce all of the offspring she'll produce, and you just count how many of her offspring didn't make it to hatching, to the larval state. So AF16 by itself, wild type organism collected in the wild, it's about 2.5% of its, organism, its offspring will die, a little bit less for HK104. But when you mate them together and look at their F1 hybrid, when it's producing its own offspring, the embryonic lethality rate basically doubles, statistically significantly so. So we've got the case where the parents are more healthy than their hybrid offspring, but the hybrid offspring is still alive and it's not sterile. It's producing more offspring. So now we have a case where we can actually start to study what are the genetic differences between AF16 and HK104 that does something like this, that makes their hybrid offspring have this increase in embryonic lethality, dead kids. So this is the spot when I say, Try to remember the background that I just told you, but we're going to jump to something totally different right now. I'm skipping over a lot of background information that would maybe be useful, but we don't have time for it. So prepare <coughs> yourselves for a mental jump. After all, it's only Friday at 3.35. You're still good, right? OK, I'm going to read this. You're going to fill in the blanks. <laughs> Mitochondria are the? Powerhouses of the cell. So you all learned from the same textbook I learned. Okay. okay, wait a second. We were talking about speciation, now we're talking about mitochondria. We'll get there. I'm going to come to you. One of the most important things mitochondria do for us is make ATP. They produce cellular energy that drives my being able to, here to you know, stand here and talk at you, interact with you. And... So mitochondrial function might be important to life. Maybe it would be important for fertility or viability. So what I'm going to tell you is we look at mitochondria in these hybrids to see if there's any evidence that maybe it's mitochondrial function in hybrids that causes them to crap out, so to speak, to be less healthy than their parents. So mitochondria are cool because they make all of our energy so that we can be alive, but they've also got some challenges they have to overcome. They have, and so for the geneticists, we have some challenges as well. Their genomes are circular, because these guys used to be bacteria before one of our ancient cells engulfed them and enslaved them to make energy for us. Every cell in our body has multiple of these organelles. So each organelle has lots of circular genomes in it, and each cell has lots of mitochondria in it. And mitochondria replicate, they don't care about the cell cycle. They replicate when they want to. They divide to make more mitochondria. Sometimes they fuse together to make fewer mitochondria. So they're really dynamic organelles. And one of the most important aspects for a geneticist that studies mitochondria is that as part of producing ATP, electron transport, which I'm not going to go into. If you're in biochemistry, you'll love it, I'm sure, produces peroxides, free radicals that are damaging to both DNA and to proteins. So basically, those mitochondrial DNA circles, the plasmids, the genomes, are sitting in an organelle that's making a bunch of free radicals that mutate, cause damage to, and mutate the mitochondrial genome. The mitochondria have their own DNA that encodes proteins that are important. Oh, by the way, did I tell you what those proteins are? They're all of these proteins that make up the electron transport chain complexes. 
So you can read how many different subunits there are. There's something like 100 or more total proteins that make up this complex and the series of complexes that are critical for you and I to be alive, making ATP for us. So you better believe that the interactions between those proteins that form these complexes are really important. That those proteins all fit together properly to transfer electrons from one end to the other, pump hydrogen, and produce ATP. You remember we were talking about proteins fitting together a while back when I was talking about a model for speciation? Okay, so this is the theory of mitochondrial nuclear coadaptation. Basically says that these colored proteins, the ones that I know you can't read the letters of, but that's fine. The proteins that are symbolized by colors are encoded by the mitochondrial genome. So wait, the mitochondria doesn't make all of the proteins that it needs for producing ATP. Where are all the other proteins coming from? The uh, colorless ones, the blue ones here, that are not labeled. They're proteins, they're encoded by DNA. That's not the mitochondrial DNA. What other DNA does the cell have? The genomic, yeah, the nuclear DNA. So our nuclear, our linear chromosomes encode all of the rest of those light blue proteins. So the mitochondrial genome encodes some of the proteins. The nuclear genome encodes the other proteins. But they all have to fit together nicely inside the mitochondria to conduct electron transport. And this sets up this concept of mitonuclear coevolution, which I'm going to explain to you in a little cartoon. Basically, the, the concept is if we've got linear DNA, and I'm going to diagram mitochondrial DNA as colored circles. So this is an HK104, for example, on the left. That combination of blue nuclear chromosomes and blue mitochondrial chromosomes is fine. But, and the combination of red nuclear chromosomes with AF16's mitochondria is fine. So what that means is there's a genetic difference between the red and the blue circular chromosomes, too. The mitochondrial genomes of AF16 and HK104 are also different. Which means that when you combine one population's nuclear chromosomes with the other population's mitochondria, which we can do, Take the mitochondria from one population, stick it in the cell of the other population, get rid of their own native mitochondria. That is thought not to be good. And I'll tell you why in just a second. I'll remind you. So mitonuclear coadaptation means you need to have, the theory is, you need to have the same nuclear genome and the same mitochondrial genome from the same population to be healthy. Mismatching is bad. And this is one of the ways we know this. this is not a worm. This is a Tigriopus copepod, a marine invertebrate, from a lab that works at UC San Diego in Scripps. They did exactly what I just described. They have, in black columns, there are data from individual copepods that had matched genomes, that is, the linear nuclear and the circular mitochondrial genomes were from the same population. So those are matched. Expect them to be healthy. And then they also purposefully mismatched one population's nuclear chromosome with a different population's mitochondria, that's circular genome. And those are the hashed columns. So they, they've got control experiments, wild-type organisms, and they've made these weird hybrids. They're called cytoplasmic nuclear hybrids, cybrids, because the cytoplasm comes from one, including mitochondria, from one individual, and the nuclear genome from another. And they looked at all sorts of different phenotypes, traits down here at the bottom. So let's just look, for example, at one, hatching number. The matched genomes, when you're a normal copepod, you get a relative hatching number of one. So let's say all of your offspring hatch. What happens when you mismatch the genomes? That drops to something like 70 or 65 percent. Right. So this proof that the only thing that you need to do in these invertebrates to make their offspring less healthy is you switch one mitochondrial genome for the other. That's the only difference between the black bars, matched genomes, and the gray bars, mismatched genomes. So this has not been done just in copepods. This has been done in all sorts of organisms, mice, flies, and we did it in C. briggsy. We wanted to know if in C. briggsy, when we mismatch the nuclear and the mitochondrial genes, are they screwed up? And this follows the exact same model I showed you earlier, except now I'm being a little bit more explicit that I'm saying maybe gene A is not one set of nuclear genes. Maybe gene A comes from the mitochondrial genome and gene B from the nuclear genome. 
And the reason that you have to have that match between the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome is because those sets of proteins have evolved to fit together properly. And the same is true for the blue versions of the same genes. And when you make the cybrids, or F2 hybrids for that matter, you get that situation where there's complete mismatch between the protein shapes, then maybe electron transport stops because the mitochondrial electron transport chain, the proteins don't fit together, electrons don't flow, no ATP gets made, you're toast. That's the hypothesis that we're going to create, what I'm going to show you is we created cybrids, mismatched nuclear and mitochondrial chromosomes, and we did it in this manner. You take an AF16 individual, where, again, we're looking at linear chromosomes and the circular mitochondrial genome. Here's a hermaphrodite, so we call her the mom. That may not be politically correct. I'm not sure what the appropriate pronoun is for hermaphrodite, so I'm just going to say she and he. So we've got a dad and a mom for the two different populations, and all you have to do is you assume that mitochondrial inheritance occurs maternally, which isn't actually always the case, but we'll assume that it's maternal inheritance of mitochondria. And every generation, you cross another blue guy to a hybrid. And every generation you do that, you move an entire blue chromosome into the offspring. And you do that again and again, and recombination whittles down mom's nuclear genome less and less and less every generation until you do this cross 10 times, there's only a tiny little, you probably can't even see it, there's a tiny little sliver of red, mom's nuclear genome, that survives to the 10th generation. So now we've basically made an organism that has red mitochondria inherited from mom, but the nuclear genome has been entirely replaced by the male mitochondrial genome. So now we have our cybrids, cytoplasmic nuclear hybrids. So one of the first studies we did here at Fresno State was Joel and Jamie, shown there, measured the fecundity, just like they had done with the copepods, of AF16 and HK104, the two parental strains, the wild types. They each, a single hermaphrodite, will produce something like 225 or 200 self-offspring. But look what happens when we make a cybrid. So we compare, for example, AF16 with the nuclear chromosomes, gray, with an HK104 mitochondria, that's this comparison, the black bar up here. So fecundity drops significantly. All we did was we changed the mitochondrial genome from one strain to another, mismatched, fecundity goes down. Maybe it's a speciation gene. It's a gene that's lowering the health of offspring. Not totally dead, not totally sterile, but their hybrids are definitely less healthy than their parents. Jamie also measured, react remember I said electron transport makes reactive oxygen species. Sometimes mitochondria work harder when they're not functioning properly to try to make enough ATP, and that generates more reactive oxygen species. So Jamie stained using a fluorescent dye that binds to or reacts with reactive oxygen species, and then he measured the amount of fluorescence in normal worms and in the cybrids. Big figure. Don't worry about details, I'll just point out one difference, for example. So here on the left side, again, a plain AF16 individual, low amounts of reactive oxygen species, but when we trade its mitochondria for HK104's, reactive oxygen species production goes up statistically significantly. So cybrids, fewer kids, more free radicals. Back to free radicals. So we've got evidence of an organismal level phenotype Cybrids are less healthy because they have fewer kids. Now we've got a biochemical phenotype, or an organismal cellular phenotype. So we think that's what, what's happening is that, yes, the two populations we're studying are genetically, they are genetically different. Those genetic differences, some of them are causing their hybrids to be unhealthy. So there's one other type of experiment we did, and this is what I did on sabbatical, which was we had those cybrids, with the mismatched genomes, and we wanted to know what their genotype was at every location throughout all of the chromosomes. 
six nuclear chromosomes in the mitochondrial genome. Because we had a hypothesis that, well, remember I said in this cybrid, which is drawn up here in the upper right-hand corner, right, red nuclear chromosomes, blue mitochondria. Remember that back cross scheme leaves a little tiny sliver of blue maybe in it that's left after we do all this crossing. There's still a little bit of mom's nuclear DNA left. And we were thinking that, well, if there really is this mitochondrial nuclear incompatibility, if they don't get along red and blue, or blue and red, maybe the fact that we can actually make those organisms and they're alive and they have offspring means that the most critical mitochondrial nuclear gene complexes still exist. In other words, if there are any pairs of mitochondrial genes and nuclear genes that are essential for life, if we have a live cybrid, maybe those genes that are interacting, the mitochondrial gene and the nuclear gene, maybe those are the genes that are found in that little tiny sliver of blue that's left. We can never get rid of it by crossing because if we had, those organs would be dead and we wouldn't be working with them anymore. The fact that they're still there and they're still alive means that that would indicate the location of one of the genes that's causing this hybrid phenotype. So I'm just going to show you two more pieces of data, this slide and the next one. This is one of the replicates. It's a line we call CP129. And diagrammed here on the x-axis of each of these plots, worms have six chromosomes. So there are six, chromosome one, two, three, four, five, and X. It's a sex chromosome. It screws people up all the time. I didn't get this for the first year I worked with worms. So it's Roman numerals until you get to the X. It's not 10. It's the X chromosome. Right, so they've got five autosomes. They've got one sex chromosome. And I've coded here on the left, If this is the, basically the genotype at every spot across each of the chromosomes. If they're red, AF16, then you get a dot up here. Wherever they're blue, you get a dot down here on the bottom. So these are lines that are supposed to be all red. We're looking for a little tiny piece of blue. So where's that? There's one here on chromosome three. There's a tiny little spot there that's blue in an otherwise red chromosome. And you're right, there's another pair down here on chromosome five. This is why I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to tell you the, the short version of the story. This is important. This is why scientists do replicated experiments. So we've got one other version of a cybrid, CP131, that we made separately. Two different petri dishes, two sets of crosses. It's an independent replicate. I'm going to show you its genome. So where is it blue once it renders? Where is this one blue in an otherwise red chromosome? Is it chromosome 3? That one disappeared. A new one showed up. Chromosome 2, what's the same? That one spot on chromosome 5 is blue in an otherwise red chromosome in two independent replicates. It's still not enough to say it's significant, but we're starting to look at that part of that chromosome and see what genes are there and see maybe if there are mutations there that cause this incompatibility, that causes the cybrids to have higher reactive oxygen species and lower offspring, lower fecundity. Okay. So I'm leaving you with a little application. I love science because I love learning how biology works. It's cool. But some people like things a little bit more applied. So here's one way maybe to apply this. Because mitochondria are inherited from mothers to all of her offspring in humans, usually, if she has a mutation in her mitochondria that disrupts the mitochondrial function, especially ATP production, she will pass that mutation on to every single one of her offspring. And then all of her daughters will pass it on to every single one of her offspring and so on. So it's a very predictable inheritance pattern. And there are ways of getting around this. Well, what's one way you could not have affected offspring if you are a woman that's affected with one of these disorders? What's the easiest way? What? Don't have kids. Don't have kids. Yep. No more problem. But what if you want to have kids? Three-parent fertilization. <laughs> you know the Twilight Zone theme. OK, good. Sometimes that gets lost on crowds. So the idea here is that if you have 
it, still using the red and blue, although we're not talking about worms anymore. If dad's genotype is red and mom's is blue, she might have a blue mitochondrial genome that's got this bad mutation that causes all of her kids to get the same disease, like Kern-Sayre syndrome, the picture on the previous slide. So the idea here is you take a, a, an oocyte from a mom that's got supposedly normal mitochondria, you get rid of her nuclear genes, so you just have an oocyte with mitochondria in it. And then you stick one copy of mom's chromosome in there and one copy of dad's chromosome in there, so you get a nuclear offspring from the two parents that want to have kids. You get the mitochondria from this donor, the second woman. Three-parent fertilization. And then there's this hue and cry. It's been discussed for a really long time from geneticists, from ethicists, because, well, now you're, it's not just should we do this. It's we just showed in worms, and of course, in there's copepods and drosophila and other species, that there are bad versions of mitochondrial nuclear genetic interactions. Sometimes they're incompatible with each other. Well, what do we know about question mark mom number two with the yellow? We don't know if her mitochondria is compatible with either mom or dad's nuclear chromosomes. So is this even a useful thing to try? Well, it's being tried, and we'll see what happens. By the way, if you like bioethics, ha, a couple of us, Dr. Van Laar and I, and a few faculty from philosophy are going to be at this event in a couple of weeks. And you're certainly invited. It's open to the public. If you want to learn more about genetic engineering, genetically modified organisms, humans, we'd love to share more with you about that. Now I'm going to skip over. The last part was going to be, is genetic, so look around. This is the last part. One more minute. Sorry for keeping you up over one more minute. Look around, please. You see diversity? Look at the humans, not the chairs. <laughs> the chairs are all the same. You see diversity? Well, we know, this is my genetic test, we know that there are genetic signatures of ancestry. Different groups of mutations come from different parts of the world. That's how ancestry companies can do genetic testing and kind of give you an idea about where you might be from. Is this genetic diversity going to, at some point, cause modern humans to start speciating from each other? leave you with that.